Okay, so let's start. Okay, so <laughs> hello, welcome everybody for my lecture will be about architecture and futurology. It's uh, first I, I will show you my timeline, uh, how I got to this topic. Uh, uh, it follows up from, from my studies. And uh, at the end, I will show you and explain the methodology of the futurological method called scenario planning. So this will be uh, at the end. Yeah? So first I show you the projects which led me to this interest, which I started to slowly develop. So this is my study timeline. I, I graduated, it's not visible here, but uh, sorry. I graduated with <laughs> Professor Jiřičná, a previous lecturer. Uh, I'm not sure if it had, yeah, probably it had some influence on me, but uh, I was, uh, I was fan of uh, science fiction even before I met her, <laughs> but I think in the visions we kind of, uh, kind of understood each other. So I studied in Finland for one semester, and then after I graduated, I went to Egypt. Uh, I went to Egypt, and this was my uh, first time when I started to be interested in, in social aspects of uh, architecture because I encounter some slum-like uh, conditions for living. And uh, then I, when I, at the university, we had a chance to join uh, the UAI, UIA uh, competition, uh, which was called Eradication of Poverty. So I found this, uh, this place, which is near the Coptic town in Cairo, uh, where people live on the dump and burn the waste to uh, to produce the ceramics. So I, I decided to make a project which was like uh, interested in uh, how to use low tech, uh, like the ancient technologies uh, to uh, improve the conditions of poor people and they could do it themselves. Then uh, I joined, uh, when I came back from Egypt, I joined the summer school in university in Liberec and uh, it was uh, preparation for exhibition uh, in uh, Prague, in Manes Gallery, and the topic was the future of housing. And this is where I uh, uh, like took my interest in the social aspects from Egypt, and I, I tried to apply it to the Czech conditions, uh, to panel house uh, estates, uh, which at the time after the revolution, you see it's 1999, uh, then it was like this uh, the condition of the panel estates were really low and and uh, it started to become uh, like a social problem so i i pre uh, it was i made uh, the project for exhibition which was uh, advertisement for this prefab living housing the cells which could be moved and made for young people and it was kind of ironic and like fun-like story. But, um, so this is, uh, then I went to Japan for two years to study in Professor Takeyama, uh, quite famous, uh, recently died, uh, f famous Japanese architect. And uh, there I started to uh, encounter uh, the, uh, uh, how to say, like uh, scenario-based planning. Yeah. So this was like my first time when I tried to use the scenario for for urban plan, and I did it with uh, my uh, teammate from uh, Singapore. We, we prepared this short competition project, and the story was based like it became the center of nanotechnology uh, in Japan. And when I uh, get back to Liberec, actually I. I I forget to mention that when I joined this summer school, then I uh, recently started to teach in Liberec faculty, and I teach there since now, so it's quite a history already. And uh, my, uh, the students at the time, they were more like my, <laughs> my age, <laughs> not, not very distant, so uh, I opened up the evening studio for them. Because uh, in Egypt, uh, in Egypt, sorry, in Japan, my professor often used to give uh, the topics uh, uh, 
remote, like building on Mars or on, on the moon. And I, I wanted to introduce it to, uh, to the students in Liberec. So I established the evening studio for them. And, and we, uh, we were uh, working on like colonizing uh, long multi-generation colonizing ships and so on. And I don't have actually any pictures because it was the time when we didn't really collect my, the work. It was not so important for us to collect all the data like now. So then uh, uh, at that time I was assistant and I, I switched the studio. I started to work with Slovak architect Jan Strzula, who, uh, is, uh, who used to live in Kuwait and all uh, in Africa and building. He was a, a Slovak immigrant, uh, really famous around uh, Eastern, uh, the Arab countries. So uh, I asked him to, uh, to uh, so, so we could do also some visionary topics. So we did like a um, space hotel with the students or we joined the international competition future of the cities. Uh, with students, so this was like uh, maybe my first deep encounter with thinking about what the future cities should look like. Yeah, and uh, okay, and my interest in in uh, future cities uh, evolved. So then I started to uh, study my PhD in Prague in uh, Czech Technical University, and uh, I. Uh, yeah, you see, yes, the, the visions are, this, this picture was actually uh, very famous uh, uh, at the COVID time. Uh, you could find it on the social media. And I, it was very funny because yeah, it's from the 62 year and it, it should be like a solution for overcrowded cities, overcrowded with the car. So, the, uh, so this cartoonist uh, was proposing to, <laughs> to make the cars smaller so the streets are not so crowded. Anyway, uh, so my, uh, my thesis was uh, actually, I applied for, for uh, Professor Suske because uh, I don't know if you are familiar with architect Petr Suske. He was very famous for this ecological um, thinking and architecture. I think we, he was the first one in Czech Republic doing the eco houses. He, he was famous with the uh, house which was isolated by straw and he made this uh, made uh, like uh, umbrella. The roof was like a textile umbrella. I think uh, maybe if you Google him, oh, he's really nice. Um, he used to also, yeah, actually, this is connection because in Egypt I used his book for, for my designs because he, is, uh, he lived in Africa and he was interested in uh, clay architecture and all the old principles, the low-tech principles, how to cool. So uh, I, I picked the topic. Uh, I decided to... Uh, think about uh, how architects uh, should communicate uh, with public. Because there was, uh, I, I read uh, some uh, text by Rostislav Koričanek. It was among, uh, uh, it was the discussion about architecture. And he, uh, in that uh, discussion, mentioned that architects uh, should communicate with uh, society, with public. And that the only only way how to do it is through the through the media. Uh, I must mention that at the time it was like pre Facebook time. Yeah, it was like uh, there were uh, no such a boom of social media. So really, the media were the only way how to communicate with public. So I I took this as a topic of my thesis, and uh, I decided to find out like how architect should communicate uh, with the media and okay this is like a timeline because it it consists like my project had this uh, uh, thesis uh, that architect should communicate and then I was like okay if he should communicate what it should be about uh, like okay for the past thing we have historians uh, for the present, we have also the critics of architecture, but architect is designing things and he is doing things for the future. So 
from my point of view, the only thing he should communicate about is about the future. And then it led me about like, okay, what does architect actually know about uh, the future? What does general, uh, you know, the practicing architects, what do they know? Do, uh, do they really concern about the future or uh, like how do they engage? So it led me uh, to uh, my, uh, like I had a hypothesis that, uh, okay, then he should communicate about future. So I started to, started to uh, examine and search uh, for the futurology and I also learned about the mass media communication and so on. And I prepared uh, a pilot, pilot project uh, it should be like an architecture project and, and this project I wanted to communicate through the media. So uh, this, uh, this thesis had a part of the, of the theoretic part and then it consists of a part with uh, practical projects. And I prepared the first project. I joined the com uh, exhibition called Futura Pragensis. It was with the students from Czech Technical University, and it was, as, as the name said, it was thinking about the future of Prague. So I used the scenario planning futurological method, and I, I prepared like a long story. Uh, started from year 2000, ending uh, by year 2072. Uh, and I, I made a, like really like a story of events and how they affect the architecture in, 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 uh, in Prague. And like you can see, like this image with the, uh, you know, the tourniquets, I don't know how it's in English, when you have to go through the gate, turning gate. So this was the most published, <laughs> published image from all of this, but it was uh, like the smallest <laughs> interest of mine. <laughs> so I, I was I like, um, yeah, I was hoping that uh, it will uh, get some discussion, but actually the only discussion I got was from from the historic preservation office because I <laughs> I I did some notes which were very critical to to their to their behavior and how they uh, really do the obstruction for Prague to build the new things. And at the end, I I <laughs> I like. Uh, made an event which sent, was like exhibition, uh, which uh, sent the historical preservation to Mars, like to get rid of them. So this was the only, I, I get some uh, response in their magazine <laughs> and it was the only discussion I, I got, but it was not from the public. So I, uh, yeah, this is like one, uh, how the stories look like, like always created. Uh, created some image and then, then the story and the story evolved in some this. Then I find out it's not enough for, for the thesis. So I, I asked uh, the professor uh, from the, uh, Strzula if I could prepare the topics for students and I, I prepared assignments for students which I then tried to, tried to uh, communicate through the media and get some get some uh, uh, feedback, yeah? and so the first again we are back to <laughs> what Professor Jiřična was talking about. Uh, first, I used uh, I thought there was a huge discussion about the project of Jan Kaplitsky, but it was in the summer, yeah? and then I in the summer I started to prepare the project for students about. Uh, the competitions. I get this idea. We make uh, we make like one month uh, short project at the beginning of semester, and then we make an exhibition. So I, uh, because one of the topics from the uh, government's opponents was like uh, the Prague panorama is so stable and unchanging, and we cannot add anything else. So I prepared like this visualizations of uh, actually like how the. Prague Cathedral would look like because uh, uh, actually it was a uh, long time it was unbuilt and then it's less than 100 years ago it start, uh, there, there were actually like three different proposals at the time uh, because the builders were changing so so this is uh, how the Prague's panorama could look like uh, actually and uh, 
Then I prepared, like, uh, I went through all the old magazines and gathered, uh, gathered uh, the competitions, Prague architecture competitions, and I asked uh, the students to imagine that this competition would be built and how then this would affect uh, the future evolution because each new building is like, it's changing its environment yeah? because if you design as an architect, you always uh, follow the, what's already built around and the context is important. So, so students uh, prepared like uh, really wild <laughs> ideas of how this could be. We, we, uh, we exhibited it in Prague uh, Library in Clementinum, but then because <laughs> Yeah, the discussion about the uh, Kaplitsky's library was actually happening in the summer, then this was already over. So, uh, so I, uh, we didn't get much attention then. <laughs> and so we pre I prepared even shorter project with the students. Uh, it was again uh, following the public discussion about the skyscrapers in Prague. And, and uh, so we were, uh, making happening at the Prague Castle uh, terraces, uh, and students prepared the visuals and they were walking around and trying to catch attention from public on street and testing how the high-rise buildings would change the Prague panorama. Uh, I always tend to join the students with my own projects, uh, so I prepared this one, then it later on become uh, a visual for some story in, in uh, magazine, but it was not about the panorama. Yeah. So then I have prepared one semester project because I thought, OK, maybe we should go deeper and prepare something really revolutionary. And uh, actually, this project really got the best uh, attention from media. We have been even invited uh, to uh, TV, and we were on the main news, and, and we were in the discussion. Uh, yeah, about the culture, so it was like yeah, this this kind of <laughs> succeed, but uh, uh, it was the vision of of future Prague. We made an exhibition and book of out of this. I prepared for it like uh, for the beginning. I prepared like a summary of all the ideal cities and and the visionary projects. Yeah, so so the students could build on and to see that the uh, like attempt to think about the ideal cities as long as a history of the cities. So people always try to think uh, how it should be developed in a better way. Then, because uh, this project was uh, developed in each uh, week uh, progress, each week they get some assignment and they had to work together on analysis and they prepared the overall uh, story. Uh, like a scenario um, for Prague, which was uh, which has like three main driving forces. This was like a, a transportation on the top. Yeah, they prepared like new network of transportation. Then it was like multi-central uh, city, and then uh, the green corridors, which should connect the city with the nature around. And then uh, for the next phases, when students pick their uh, spots in the city. I again prepared for them this uh, big uh, overall uh, view from the visionary projects from 60s and 70s. Some of them well known, but some of them also like from the Czech architects, not, not, not very well known around. But then uh, the students work on their own project and I think they did, did really like very good imaginative job uh, to, to uh, bring some new ideas for for the future, and even like a growing architecture, for example, here. Yeah. And yeah, one more, this should be academic uh, environment for the students. Then I, yeah, we got some some uh, feedback which I could use for my thesis, but still it was not enough, and I was always like for. Uh, I gained some knowledge from the uh, project, then I developed method for the next project, and I hope to uh, really get better <laughs> in attention, getting attention by media. Uh, then I was uh, actually invited by uh, the architecture media, uh, Stavba, 
uh, to imagine how the world would look like in 15 years. But it's actually next, <laughs> it will be next year, but it's not, not even closer what I imagined. Yeah. Uh, so I prepared this story and then it would follow uh, with one more page. So um, how crazy architecture would get, yeah, but not in 15 years. Then uh, I continued to, uh, <laughs> uh, first I had those four projects. I thought it will be enough to get enough uh, knowledge, but it was not. So I prepared another short project. It was based uh, on, uh, on this uh, project from Karel Honzik, uh, the Czech architect. He proposed in, in 1940s, he proposed how, how uh, the city would be nice without the traffic and how we could use the public spaces. So the students followed and designed this. Then uh, we offered to the uh, big conference, which was, uh, this was uh, Forum 2000 is a conference uh, which was established by Václav Havel. And it was, uh, I think each year or each two years, they made a conference on uh, very like uh, social issues, culture issues, and all these very uh, hot issues of the world. So this, uh, this year conference was the world we want to live in. And then uh, like we, we made this visual with our students. We prepared the poster uh, and to use the visual from uh, Prague 2080. And then we made uh, like uh, happening again. We were uh, in the streets and trying to find discuss with the public, uh, like, how is it called? Like, anketa, uh, anketa, <laughs> Okay, then we were walking and, and asking, asking the people around and, and people from the conference how the city uh, you would like to live on should look like. So then, then we put together all the issues and yeah, everyone would like a green city. That was the most, <laughs> like, yeah, that was the topic. Green city, not so much traffic, and uh, walkable city, and safe city. This, those were like the top that everyone would agree on. Uh, everyone wants green city. Then, uh, as an outcome, uh, I, the, at the conference, the students of economy uh, asked me to prepare international workshop for them. Uh, so I used this again, the scenario planning method, and it was like one day workshop uh, of our architecture students and the students of economy, and they should imagine how the world would look like when we run out of oil, which like, yeah, or some other energy source, which is now quite, quite actual task. Then, yeah, you can see uh, the vision from 1930. Uh, this is happening now. Actually, <laughs> people sit in the cafeteria, they don't talk to each other, but they talk to their mobiles. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, prediction. So you see the predictions very often, very often come true, but maybe they don't have the form as, uh, as uh, the author always use uh, the style of its time, but, but the main core of, of the <laughs> topic is actually happening. So uh, we get a chance. Uh, uh, or I get a chance to use uh, uh, the knowledge from, the, that was like the uh, end of, of works which were uh, uh, for my thesis, which I suc successfully finished. And then uh, my colleague had a friend uh, who became a mayor of uh, City Liberec. And he, we just talk, okay, it would be nice to make a vision for Liberec. Then he asked the mayor, and we got an offer as a, as a faculty. Uh, we got an offer to make a vision for uh, evolution of city of Liberec. And it was really well paid. So, so my colleague, he is uh, uh, originally from Liberec. I'm not, I'm from Brno. And he knew the, uh, the politicians. And he arranged this, and then I gave uh, uh, my knowledge from previous projects, uh, the, uh, the methodology, and we prepared this uh, vision for City of Liberec. Uh, it was two semester work in, in uh, like, this is like a timeline. In first semester, we, 
we prepared with students, like uh, teams of students, they prepared the different stories of uh, how Liberec could evolve. And then uh, the other semester we made a synthesis and we, we uh, made a product which we uh, submit to the city. Uh, so, so we made like an analysis, then we uh, discovered the potential of the Liberec. Then we put the questions like why things should happen, how they should happen, and what should happen. Then we prepared the strategy, strategy program strategy. And then we apply it for the urban plan of the city, for the urban structures. Uh, and we made the maps of, of built environment, uh, traffic, uh, uh, greenery, and economy. Uh, so we prepared a set of, it was like a 100 pages uh, book and then big maps. Uh, so in, in that book we prepared many. Uh, we use the method of structural planning. I don't know if you are familiar, but we are not using it here because it's not our uh, legislative in Czech Republic, definitely not. But we had a colleague we invited to participate. Maybe you heard of him, Jiří Klokočka. He used to live in uh, Belgium. Yeah or Holland, no, Belgium. And they're using, their, uh, their using structural planning for urban planning. They don't have this zoning plans like we have, but the structural plans actually uh, reveal, uh, reveal the connections, like how the city works. It's like in the organism, yeah? like uh, the veins and, and nerve system. So it's discovering the systems in the city, their interconnectivity, and they proposing what should be, what should be connected. You you just uh, find out the points which are sick in the city, you, and you proposing what should be connected. And so, uh, we pre prepared these structural plans for the city. We uh, made like plans for, for example, for the barriers in the city or for the development of economic zones and so on. This got, it was published in uh, ERA magazine actually. So uh, I think it got kind of attention. So this is just cut out of the final, uh, final plan which we submitted to the city. It shows this one is the greenery, like the dots are for example the alleys of the trees and the new, new water uh, ponds on, on the river and so on. So it should, uh, this is similar like we, what we proposed in Prague to have the green corridors which are connecting the center of the city with the neighboring uh, nature and, and allowing people to walk freely in the greenery. All the, so that's the green cities people want. <laughs> so we try to propose like this is uh, the multi-central, uh, this is uh, the built environment which shows uh, the dark, darker is more dense uh, built environment, and then the points are like where should be the local centers. Because what do we think? Like the multi-centric uh, city is better because it's reducing uh, the traffic. Uh, if you, if uh, people don't need all of them to go to the one center and they can spread, then they don't really create that much traffic, and they can uh, then the city can be more easily walkable for example. So, so this was, but uh, the problem was when before we finished this project, the mayor of city was exchanged by their opponent party and uh, just, uh, you know, like, like uh, because it was uh, the friendliness or unfriendliness, then uh, the new mayor, she was like, really like, I don't care about this project at all. <laughs> and they just put it in the drawer. <laughs> so, but not now, now situation changed because my colleague became the main, main architect of City of Liberec. I think this, this project helped him a lot because he had a vision of what to do with the city. And this project uh, uh, show, was showing how to develop uh, from the small steps, like really like, from the steps which you could do now, like make better public spaces, put more greenery, build more, more housing in the center of the city. And you can get to the bigger steps, to bigger picture continuously. So he's now starting with those small steps, like uh, 
for example, he's uh, putting out the pavement and making making uh, uh, making the surfaces to catch more water, so the water could suck in the place and some small steps one by one and, and you can see it when you walk the city of center and you can see someone is really <laughs> started to taking care uh, in some systemic way. Then uh, we establish at the time we established department of urban planning at our faculty and and another colleague the head of department Radek Suhanek he he had then uh, good connections with the with the governor of Liberec region. And then we got uh, uh, another project as a faculty because we had this success with the Liberec vision. We made uh, like a, a set of smaller visions for Liberec region. So we were work. it was like many semestral project and, and it had one main topic. It was the city Ralsko. I don't know if you are familiar, but uh, this place was uh, the base of Russian army, which, which left uh, the place in, I don't know, 92. And then this, this city is abandoned, full of ruins, and but the wild nature is taking over the place. So so we were proposing a new city in, in the city of Rausko, but then many other activities. So, and we made a book of projects for Liberec region. So this is like, because uh, this is funny, because as a, by size, the city of Ralsko is actually like a fifth biggest city in Czech Republic, but there's actually nothing there. It's like by inhabitants, it's maybe 160, because there is like just few abandoned panel houses areas in, and there is the biggest uh, uh, airport in the mid central Europe. Actually, it was even uh, this airport uh, should be like a backup for for spaceships for, from Baikonur uh, as this Russian army was occupying. So it's a really interesting area and we proposed like this new city for, uh, for the Liberec region because it's close to uh, Mlada Boleslav where they make the Škoda cars. So it's like a very nice nature, really like. So again, some nice like, yeah, here. <laughs> 100 years and we have we have the vacuum cleaners automatic they are, are running in many homes so the visions really come through so we are moving and my vision uh, to have my own studio at the faculty also came through uh, and i named my studio on the edge and uh, uh, it was uh, with the previous dean, Zdeněk Franek, he got me this chance to open the studio and I was con like putting the, uh, the topics on the edge really. Like I, I like to question what's like on the edge between possible, possible, or now, or tomorrow, or, or the technological edge or any edge possible you can think. So just show you a few, few uh, student works. Like for example, this one is uh, the post-catastrophic underground city. And uh, yeah, the t theme of my studio was always to think about self-sufficient structures, the cities which are, which are working uh, sustainably, sufficiently. And I think the best, uh, best way to practice uh, this is on these visionary projects, which, which are really detached, they are off-grid. So you don't, uh, you cannot think about any uh, any supply f from anything. Yeah, you have to make everything by yourself. So they, that's why I'm, I'm like uh, using these environments and these topics to to work on the systemic thinking. So you can really understand the system of city or or the structure, what's necessary, what what you can get rid of, but what is like essential. So, or I'm testing like uh, new things. Uh, this was uh, the project for Sedlets near Kutná Hora. It's the UNESCO uh, heritage. And uh, there is one, uh, it's very famous Bonary. I don't know, maybe if you Google the subjects, it's, uh, it's the chapel where everything is chandeliers and everything made out of bones because there was this huge uh, cemetery removed. And 
So one student, she made, she used uh, the augmented reality to, to actually make the city more walkable. Because uh, if you would know the Kutná Hora, there are two uh, famous cathedrals. There is one cathedral in Sedlec near the Bonary by Santini. And then you have the most famous Santa Barbara in, in the city. But there are buses coming from Prague. They stop at one cathedral. They stop at other cathedral and go back to Prague. And no one really walks the city between those two places. And it's a walkable distance. But yeah, there is nothing interesting. So she, she proposed uh, to use the elements of the bones. And, and it has some nice, uh, nice uh, story behind this to, to make people to walk the city and, and discover things around. So, and what I'm uh, like continuously was uh, working on, there were two topics. One was the floating cities uh, because of the rising ocean level and the uh, plastic pollution of the oceans. And the other then will come later is the colonization of the solar system. So I'm, uh, I'm working, uh, I always again like prepare the, the big overview like what's what has been done in this topic, like uh, how people really actually live in floating cities now and what people imagine. But this is just a short uh, example. And then the students uh, are working with the topic. Like, for example, this is uh, the 3D printed city from the plastic waste, which is uh, being catched uh, at the river delta. This one is actually at the Chinese Delta, uh, because this uh, the most of the plastic pollution comes from five biggest rivers, and if you catch the plastic at the delta, then it don't go to the ocean, and you can print the city. Actually, this this uh, city uh, the student really printed. <laughs> he he built uh, the 3D printer and print this city himself in the small scale. Then I. Uh, colonization of the solar system. This is my like, favorite topic. And I uh, get back to the previous project with the students, but this more systematic approach. Uh, I prepared, again, like uh, a big story of, uh, of our, our visions of colonizing space. They, they, they come back to antique times and uh, all, all the ancient stories through the visions of how uh, people travel to moon, uh, through the pioneers of cosmonautics. Yeah, I like to sh this, this picture. Yeah. <laughs> you see the greenery, floating windows. <laughs> yeah, Tsiolkovsky is really like, it was one of three pioneers of cosmonautics, and, and uh, his visions are so great. So. <laughs> Yeah, isn't it fun? Like, yeah, when you float out of <laughs> the chamber. Um, anyway, so, and then you have uh, the approaches which are uh, realistic. Uh, all this uh, Bigelow Aerospace Moon company is building these inflatable uh, modules for the lunar settlements. They are making mock ups. Uh, Foster is uh, preparing the 3D printed. Uh, lunar base for ESA, yeah, and, and they, they are actually like prototyping in and, and trying to build in reality. Then again, you have some other studies, maybe the Russian one, and, uh, and is now preparing the Artemis project, which is to put men on moon again and to set the base there. And then uh, this is from the first, uh, it was the biggest group of students who work on this. Uh, and they, they again use the scenario planning for how, how the evolution will spread through the solar system. And this would be like one of the first thing, uh, the hotel and spaceport on the uh, orbital elevator. And I, uh, I tend to join the students also with my project, so I, I, can, <laughs> I can't <laughs> resist this. Yeah. So I, I design also moon base myself. And this should be, again, like I think a lot of the sustainability and self-sufficiency and all, all of the 
interlinking of the systems, how to really build off-grid and how to be uh, like uh, survive out of the planet. Then another group of students, uh, this is like one of my favorite, it's like uh, drilling uh, the station in the ice and covering it with the ice, ice uh, umbrella. <laughs> yeah. And again, I, I joined the students with my another uh, moon base, is the kinetic base, which is walking the moon, and it's again like self-sufficient. And so I think this will be, yeah, I think this will be from the projects all. Yeah. So think about uh, how how you can move this uh, visions to the reality, so we can maybe catch some rays on Mercury one day or explore the seas of Neptune. Yeah, so let's let's hope for. And here, uh, so this uh, my my uh, continuous effort in my studio. I I put as a base for my habilitation work, uh, which which puts together its mapping the history of futurology. Then it formulates the method for architects and urban planners how to use these methods in their in their design and. In, uh, in the second and third part, uh, there were the projects by students, which you could see uh, here. Yeah, this is oops, 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 oops. this one. Yep. No, this one. Yeah. So the first one was the habilitation, then the others were the student projects with conclusions. So now I will try to put you more into the futurologic methods. So you could see the effort of uh, foreseeing the future is old as the mankind. Uh, you could, people always wanted to know what's coming and what they should look for and uh, be ready for. So from the priests and seers, oracles, and the astrologists, um, then you get the utopian visions of ideal cities, and then the dystopian when when the civilization evolved. <laughs> so, and then we got really a uh, big movement on uh, science fiction literature, which actually is uh, very important, even if think, people think it's like a side field. But uh, the futurological uh, uh, companies they find out that the science fiction literature is uh, changing our world uh, more than anything else because actually the people who are in, in science, they love to read science fiction and they think, okay, that's such a great idea. I want to make it real. Yeah, so many, many ideas from science fiction are coming through. And so if you read science fiction, then you are more prepared for <laughs> future than, than others are. Yeah, so it's not just uh, some side, side field. So after uh, World War II, uh, there was like a start of real futurologic, uh, uh, futurology as a method, as a science. Uh, in uh, 1946, the Rand Corporation, American Compor uh, Corporation, they started to uh, uh, make the visions how uh, the world should evolve and be ready. Then uh, in Europe, uh, then you have uh, the group Futuribles. It's the French, French approach. And then the main, main ca Mankind 2000 International uh, in 60s. I think the 60s were like the boom of, uh, boom of uh, futurology. Then uh, you probably already heard of it, Club of Rome. It's, uh, uh, People think it's like this mysterious uh, uh, group of uh, chosen ones, uh, but actually it was uh, it was established uh, from from uh, really like big thinkers and uh, and philosophers and uh, scientists to think about uh, where the uh, civilization is heading and what we should uh, take care of. And uh, actually, the first trip, they, uh, there will become a practice that there are uh, reports to Club of Rome. There are uh, books written by um, different scientists from different fields. And the first report to Club of Rome 
the limits of growth in uh, 1972 was it's considered as a first eco-futurological study because it's really also the time when they say, okay, uh, the planet resources are not uh, infinite and we are in this speed, we will run out very fast and, and it will cost us a lot. So you can see it's 50 years and <laughs> we didn't get much farther but yeah, now it's because it's a bit almost too late, so now we are trying to take this seriously. But uh, the futurology uh, born each year, the, uh, uh, they, the reports to Club of Rome, they were trying to uh, show some aspects of our civilizations which are not okay and not going the right direction. Yeah. So, uh, important, I think, project is the Millennium Project. It was established by uh, UN and UNESCO, like a development uh, program. They used to uh, put uh, each year, they published a book uh, called State of the Future. And uh, they set always like 15 global challenges, like uh, the topics which should be taken care of. Uh, so uh, this, uh, like uh, the work of the futurological groups is continued, but what, uh, what's more in, interesting for us as architects are outcomes of this uh, project. So like uh, first important for architects was the uh, conference of Habitat, which happened in 76, and it was the first global effort to think about how the urbanization, uh, where is it leading and how we uh, could uh, make uh, its uh, outcomes less less drastic. Yeah? So uh, I don't know if you heard, but I hope yes. Uh, if you are in sustainable thinking, then uh, Agenda 21 established in 1992 was like the very important issue. It got even into our legislation in Czech Republic. There were like cities who put it into their own agenda and trying to accomplish uh, Agenda 21 sustainable uh, goals. They were not really goals, but it was about sustainability. Then you have Habitat 2. It had, again, some uh, important outcomes, but not yet so visible as now. And then followed the Millennium Development Goals by uh, United Nations. Uh, they were like uh, uh, set in year 2000, and they were for 15 years. Yeah. Then they were replaced now by SDGs. So, uh, but uh, this uh, Millennium Development Goals, they were not uh, concerned about architecture or urban planning. It's, it was more about uh, life's conditions. And so you have. What's happening now, what you can, uh, as an architect or urban planners, follow? It's World Urban Forum. Uh, it's happening, actually, I think, each year. Very important event uh, where uh, people discuss the future of urban planning. Okay, maybe I have it on, on the other. Yeah. So next one is uh, this year uh, in June, you can see here. World Urban Forum in Katowice, so very near, uh, because usually it's on some other part of planet. Uh, so, uh, so go there if you have time. <laughs> Maybe you get some interesting knowledge. Then you can follow uh, the C40 activity, uh, Cities for uh, Climate Leadership Group. They had like maybe two or three years ago, they had uh, this big conference, I don't know, Paris or somewhere in Europe. Uh, it's more uh, for leaders of the city. It's not that much for the architects, but it's interesting to see for the architects how, how people plan the cities without architects and urban planners. Yeah. Then, then you can follow the World uh, City Summit if you, if you like to travel far, because it's always happening in Singapore. Uh, and uh, we get to Singapore uh, later on when I show you the method because Singapore is uh, really like a leading city in the world in sustainability. Then, uh, okay, didn't I get it? So then you have the SDGs, like uh, uh, those uh, 17 goals uh, which are trying to make our life uh, really sustain on this planet. And uh, uh, 
this, uh, this really became big uh, activity. You can see it now everywhere and it's affecting all activities in, uh, in planning and, and our lives and I think it will be even more important. Uh, you can find uh, some knowledge hubs and, and you can follow, follow the documents. Uh, for us, it's more most important goal 11. Yeah? So, so to make the city sustainable. So, uh, I don't know if you already went through the documents I gave you the last time. If you started to work on it, you will find some of them have these topics. Then we have habitat free. Most of the documents I gave you, uh, I will explain you maybe later because I. Uh, Upload it and explain last time. So you can see all those all those branches of UN are uh, cooperating on preparing the habitat. Yeah? So it's almost all the branches uh, uh, what uh, forms the UN United Nations. So they prepare tons of tons of uh, documents which should help uh, architects and developers to make the cities more sustainable and you can follow the activities like local governments for sustainability, Euro cities, like Covenant of Mayors, Institute for Sustainable Futures, uh, or you can see this uh, LIFCOM awards. This is actually very old award for the city which uh, was following the Agenda 21, so it's still going on. And this is uh, like a big event which is uh, ahead of us. It's a uh, UIA World Congress in Copenhagen, so uh, probably it's really worth to go there. And I, I gave you these examples of uh, SDG good practice on, on the Google disk. If you had time, it was prepared especially for this event, and I think they will prepare more documents on this. So do, what's the time? Do we have time? So, okay, it's not bad. So, uh, Futurology as, uh, as a science, uh, they developed uh, really, uh, really big uh, uh, instruments, scientific instruments. So you, they, they made their own methodology. And uh, if you would uh, get interest in the past, it was not always called futurology because in the Eastern Bloc, they call it prognostics. Yeah, because they had to have their own term, which was not capitalist. So, so Eastern Bloc had a prognostics and the Western had futurology um, or forecasting. But now I think the term futurology became like uh, official. So for, uh, I think the most important or most, not important, most useful for us uh, architects in our process is the scenario planning. The simulation models would be great, but it's really like time consuming. Yeah? If, we, if we could have <laughs> uh, and build such models, this would be perfect, but uh, I don't think it's in our, in our reach to use this method. So scenario planning was first uh, uh, introduced by uh, Pierre Vac. He was working for Shell company. Shell, at the time, it was very small uh, oil company and they establish uh, the division of uh, scenario planning. And uh, in 72, they, they, uh, they actually prepared uh, this first scenario. And then, then Yom Kippur war happened and all the oil, uh, oil industry went down and only Shell survived and it made them the leader in the, in the field because they were prepared, they were ready what's happening. Uh, and, and uh, so their scenario uh, planning team uh, became very famous. They even help, uh, uh, for example, in change of uh, establishing uh, the system in South uh, Africa. Uh, they had this Mount Flare scenario. They, uh, they were uh, working uh, with uh, political leaders how, and they prepared three different scenarios, how to change the system. So it's like really, uh, interesting job and, and since 91 uh, they are preparing they prepared the scenario for Singapore so Singapore was the first city using the scenario planning 
uh, for city development. And uh, that's why they are even, like when I said this city summit, uh, it's happening in, in Singapore because they are one of the leaders. Yeah? They are, they are uh, having the visions where they want to head and what's important. And scenario planning even became so uh, like important in the, uh, in the uh, field of economy. So the Oxford Sites Business School of Economy, they, uh, they prepared a scenario planning study program from years 2004. So, so we are not uh, 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 among some uh, clouds and visions. This is like a established method and, and really uh, like uh, useful. You can, uh, if you go to Shell uh, web page, they have uh, the page for scenarios. You know, I'm not no fan of Shell at all. You know, if, <laughs> I, if you see the way they, they mine in Africa, it's really shameful. And I don't know if it's, if it's, <laughs> if it's like uh, really using any outcomes of this uh, scenario team, but their scenario team is, is excellent and really doing a uh, great job. So you can, you can go through some of their scenarios to see they prepare at least, always at least two scenarios um, so they can compare which direction uh, the future is uh, evolving. Or this one, for example, have like uh, three different scenarios. It depends on how you put the driving forces. But the scenarios are used for some other uh, things as well, like this, uh, there was this uh, Planetary Defense Conference uh, 2019, and they were doing, uh, I think, five or six days exercise. They were doing scenario of uh, Earth being hit by, by an uh, asteroid. Now you could see it in this fun movie. No, not really fun movie. You know, Don't Look Up. Have you seen it on, on Netflix? Uh, not very funny, yeah. <laughs> That's, but uh, yeah, like this was happening uh, online uh, during this conference, and really all people from different fields, like from governors and, and the lawyers, and all the, all the experts from different uh, fields of uh, human activists were planning what would happen if this asteroid would really uh, go and hit hit uh, the Earth. This is my own example of a scenario from my from my uh, uh, PhD work, as I show you, my pilot study. And uh, this was, for example, my scenario for my moon base, how I use uh, to build on, to set set environment for. So uh, as for methodology of scenario planning, you, you have two kinds of uh, scenarios. One are adaptive and transformative. Adaptive are like revealing the risks and potentials and make potentials and make you uh, prepare yourself for what's coming. And the transformative scenarios are like what they what Shell did in Mount Flare in South uh, Africa to transform something the way you want to. Yeah? You want some outcome and then you try to think the steps how to get there. So and what is important, those stories are like what is possible, not what will happen, yeah? because uh, the future is uh, as you see on uh, so on the pictures, it's not happening. Maybe the core idea stays, but it's happening maybe differently. So when you construct the scenario, you always use driving forces. And, and uh, those are like main fields which are being used. It's like a politics, economy, technology, social situation, and environmental aspects. You pick, pick the topics out of these fields. And you, uh, you think like which trends will have the impact. You have to choose. It depends on the scenario or on, on, on the work you uh, do actually. So, so it will be different uh, uh, if, you, if you do it short term or long term. So how the trends evolve and how they will affect the system and how the system will look like after, after this. So, then you again use uncertainties because those are the things uh, which like change the game. This is something you can maybe think of, but it's yeah, it's uncertain. Yeah, something completely crazy could happen, and it changed the system, like the war in Ukraine. No one would expect this, like 
and it's changed everything. So those are like you you uh, try to think about uncertainties, and then you then you uh, make your uh, scenario like step by step. You creating uh, again like a stepping stones how the future evolves, and these stepping stones they create they call it early warning system because then when when the time passes you 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 can see. Because usually you create more than one scenario, so you get the chances how the things can evolve. And if you have those stepping stones, and for example, after five years, you can see which scenario is coming to is coming to happen to to reality, and then you can follow from this step. This is how, for example, shell shell operates. So they don't they don't like. Uh, the scenarios are like continuously developed. So after five years, you see, okay, this scenario is not happening. This one or this one, they are almost going to happen. Then you can you can think from these points on. And uh, what is uh, important outcome of scenarios is this to-do list. It's like you pick the things which uh, probably could happen in in future which are important and for which you can prepare yourself. That's how Shell got into the leaders, because they were ready for something would happen. So you, you have uh, the opportunities for innovations, and you, have prepare, you prepare yourself for crisis. So uh, you reveal these opportunities and challenges. And how I, uh, this is how I think how to apply it in urban planning. Because uh, like most of the uh, scientific fields have very narrow and deep view. Yeah? They don't see, they just dig their holes so deep, so they don't have any connection with the world around. They don't see how their work affects uh, the rest. Yeah? They, just, they just dig and, and, and go deeper. And an urban planner is trained to uh, think in, in wide context to put interlink all, all very different subjects uh, from, from philosophy to technology to uh, social science to uh, whatever, yeah, ecology, economy, uh, policy, everything. Yeah? You have to integrate things because the city is the living system which integrates all. As again, uh, Professor Jiřičná, she spoke about that everything <laughs> <laughs> Everything is connected to architecture. Yeah, so, so that's what you as urban planners or architects, you have to think in this wide system. Everything, uh, everything is connected and, and is uh, like uh, yeah, evolving together. So uh, how I uh, uh, used it and I, I use it in, in teaching, so in the process of of design, I think you always have to start from historical experience. You have to uh, go deep and learn from what was here before. You have to do the analysis of the current state as as precise as possible, because yeah, oh, yeah, more precise you get, better outcome you get. You have to understand the relationships within the system. You have to understand what influence what. Yeah, what are uh, and you have to discover the main drivers of development. This this varies from each project because yeah, in some places uh, the driver would be very ecological, in some it would be very economical or scientific. You have to uh, pick which driving force is important in your in your topic. Then you imagine how the future could evolve. Where where does it go? Then you make a scenario. From the scenario, you make a concept for your project, and then you design the project. So, so which project, uh, which topics will be influential is is usually coming out of the analysis. Yeah, of when you analyze the current state and you see, but you you have to have this background with, with the history because there you can follow follow the line of evolution of different topics. So. It's important to work with history and with the current state to uh, to reveal what's coming. Yeah. So how it evolves, then how it will function after this. So this is, for example, some 
some of <laughs> the driving forces which we as an urban planner can use. So those are like local, if you really think in, in small local context. Uh, and and the global, yeah. So it's like okay, you can I can give you time if you can read some of them. It's like yeah, no, it's everything. <laughs> yeah, so and I could uh, every time I, I I read it, I add something because ah, oh, why I don't add this? I <laughs> then next time I I add something more because it's like everything is really uh, important and it's it can. This is when when I was working with students on this project 2080. Then. Uh, uh, I, I gave these topics to the students, and each student uh, did an analyze of some topic, then they share it, and from this they decided that the driving forces will be uh, the transportation, uh, greenery, and, and the multi-central system. So this is how, how they worked uh, in, in the project from, from these topics. They find out, okay, the, when they analyze them, they say, okay, uh, maybe Maybe the immigrants and multicultural thinking was not important at the time because it was before the migration crisis. So they didn't have any, like they say, okay, this is not going to change our city, but this will. So you have to go through, through uh, things and find out and decide for yourself what's, what's the driving force which is going to change the future. Yeah, so. As I say, uh, said before, it uh, depends uh, what impact each topic has. It depends on the uh, scale of project you're working on. You have to choose carefully what's useful and what you cannot leave behind. But what will be uh, either uh, topic you choose, the topic which will remain uh, for us for future is adaptability. That is the biggest topic for us, all of us, because uh, okay, some of uh, some predictions say we will have the dry land, no water. Some of them they say we uh, we freeze because the Gulf uh, uh, is a current will stop. Then we freeze here. Some prediction says the all the all the ice will melt. Then then it becomes underwater. Some some predictions are that we will be overpopulated and and it will be just sprawling uh, slums. Some say that the population will shrink and, and we will then again <laughs> become much uh, smaller numbers. So, but we have to adapt. <laughs> so, this is uh, architect, <laughs> the 3D printing <laughs> vision from 1910. Yeah? We have it <laughs> now. We print 3D <laughs> buildings. So, uh, yeah, your role as an architect is to bring a positive vision in these challenging times. Uh, so, so, as old thinkers, Seneca, yeah, if you don't know where to sail, no wind is good for you. Uh, so, so this is the truth. You need to know where to sail so you can you can pick the good wind to take you there. So, look to. Uh, the future as a, our game room, and we we bring the positive vision, yeah. exercise uh, mentally, and bring the good visions, and so we don't so we go uh, bright futures and not to to some future we don't want. <laughs> yeah. So that's all. Thank you. Well, so I hope it was not too long for. So and now you have some questions, or let's uh, if we have time. We can discuss. No. Ah, are you overloaded by informations now? <laughs> I'm sorry.
uniform space, and that the yeah. public doesn't mm. have the chance to to have influence and impact uh -huh. on this style. Yeah. But we are now far from this because we have the social social media, and I think now uh, we have the other uh, other problem that people are like uh, coming to the bubbles, <laughs> yeah, and they don't communicate with each other, and they don't really care about <laughs> the other bubbles or hate them. Yeah, so so yeah, we had either a uniform <laughs> style or we have lots of different styles, but don't don't find. Uh, common language, so uh, you never, you know.